Dear listeners, welcome to Faces of Digital Health, a podcast about digital health and how healthcare systems adopt technologies. My name is Tiasha Zaitz, and today we're going to jump to Japan. I talked to Adrian Sosna, VP of Global Sales at Hakarus, a Japanese company developing AI solutions for manufacturing and medical industries. Their Salus platform for medical and life sciences uses medical imaging data such as CT and MRI scans, time series data such as ECG data and medical records to create precise complex tools and help caregivers make decisions based on data-driven insights. Adrian Sosna is originally from Sweden but has been living in Japan for several years now. He shared his insight into the life in Japan, the tech ecosystem, and we also touched upon the challenges in developing AI for healthcare and medicine. Enjoy the show and do subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yet to be notified about new episodes automatically. I really look forward to sharing more information about the Japan in the next episode where you will hear four Japanese entrepreneurs talk about Japan, healthy living and some of the solutions they're building. The next episode will be the first one in the series of discussions dedicated to H-Tech improvements of lives of the elderly and how we can make our last years of life pain-free. With over 2.3 million deaths due to COVID by February 2021, 2020 definitely opened up the space for us to discuss death, rethink how we wish to spend our last years of life and fear the end of life less. So stay tuned. Before we go to Adrian, a quick word about our today's sponsors, Crosby and Jetro Berlin. Crosby is a Berlin-based company with a focus on bringing together Japan and the global startup ecosystem. Crosby creates a tech marketplace for both companies and startups, promotes development of new innovations and drives business and societal impact. And Jetro Berlin is the Japan external trade organization promoting mutual trade and investment between Japan and the rest of the world. Adrian, let's start with something easy. You're originally from Sweden, but have been living in Japan for what, eight years by now? So I, I've been in Japan for six, soon seven years, but, but I've, I've been in Asia for, for nearly a, a decade. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been a, it's been an interesting and, and a very rewarding decade, I'll say. How would you describe the country based on the time you've been living and working there? What strikes you in the culture? How, how advanced is it in the digital health space? So the very first time I visited Japan was in 2008 or 2009. So it's, it's uh, uh, more than, than 10 years ago. And quite frankly, I was disappointed by how low tech it was. I, I, I had this perception coming from abroad that, that Japan was more of a digital and connected country than it, it turned out to be. Uh, and it's still true that there are things here that, that are not uh, uh, so digitized yet. Uh, for instance, we use a type of stamp to sign documents and, and uh, various official documents, a personal seal that you need to have. So sometimes you can't sign with your signature, you need this special uh, personal seal. But I would say that in the past decade or so, uh, you've really seen a dramatic realization on the side of, of Japanese society of the need to digitize and the need to adopt uh, new technologies. So, so I've definitely seen payment systems or everyday life activities or apps or all these things that have definitely happened across the world have also kind of really come into to their own here in, in, in Japan. In terms of, of living in the country and working in the country, I've, I've always found myself in a role where I connect Japanese uh, companies to foreign markets and, and foreign audiences. And I think that's a very rewarding place to be. 
because there is an incredible attention to detail, craftsmanship, and just deliverance of, of stellar products in Japan. But there isn't necessarily the, the ability to bring that product or that solution to other markets. It's, it's sometimes very inward facing. So if you can come in and, and help a corporation kind of go global or, or find new homes for their solutions, that's, that's really, uh, something that, that I enjoy doing. And, you know, this country has amazing food, amazing people, and, and just, it's a very inviting culture, I would say. Well, one thing that I'm clearly wondering is the whole culture around healthcare, around health, and clearly digital health. I remember that uh, I did a, I did a piece two years ago, and there was a lot of reports in the media how Japan is using robots um, to help the elderly in elderly care. But and also because uh, even the fact is that today we are more open to technology than we were perhaps uh, two years ago. But uh, robots specifically have a different. Uh, perception from the Japanese people to compared to the West because they're seen that's how it was explained to me that robots are seen more as friends first than somebody that's going to destroy you such as you know the Terminator that we know from the, the Western uh, movies so you know from, from that perspective and the fact that we know that Japanese uh, stereotypically drink a lot of green tea which has antioxidants etc how do you see the healthcare picture in Japan? Yeah, no, I, I think that's 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 a good uh, question. I, I think uh, if you compare the the scare of of the Terminator um, in the late nineties, uh, Sony made a lot of news for making the uh, the first robot dog which is called Aibo. And I, I think that gives you a good indication of the different perception of, of robots. Uh, not a killing machine, but, but man's best friend. Um, I think that that the first thing you have to consider and, and be quite uh, frank with is this is an aging society that's the most rapid aging society in, in the world. And there is, there is a growing shortage of people that are able to provide care for, for the elderly as well as to provide care for, for the rest of society. And I think as a necessity, in addition to, a, to, to importing, uh, uh, labor, Deploying robots, deploying automation solutions, deploying ways to digitize the, the healthcare system is seen as a necessary thing, not as a novelty. It's, it's a solution to a, a very acute uh, problem. Um, so, 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 so I think that part definitely exists that it's, it's both driven by a general, general uh, curiosity and friendliness towards robotics and new technologies, but also the necessity of, of staffing up to support, uh, an, an ever growing, uh, population. In general, I would say that, that the, the interactions I've had personally with, with healthcare in, in Japan have, have been very good. It's, it's a very, well structured, um, funded by uh, a public uh, health insurance system, which which everyone uh, contributes to, and it, it is definitely still largely analog, uh, but but it is is showing its potential for for digitization. How much options do you see for foreign countries to enter Japan with all the digitalization solutions? Because a lot of work has been done already on EHRs and things like that. So if the system there is very analog, it seems like a good market opportunity. I don't know how, to which extent, you know, the, the cultural barriers and the fact that things would need to be translated to Japanese are a barrier. How do you see that? Well, I, I think if you want to do business in Japan, you have to do business in Japanese. So localizing any type of, of product you built elsewhere is, is the starting point. But with that said, there is, is, is definitely a lot of potential to bring solutions to uh, Japan. Th that being said, I also want to give a, a shout out both to, to, to my own company, to, to Hackers that I work for and other Japanese, uh, companies that are in the digital health, uh, care kind of 
uh, field, there's a lot of work that's already being done. There's a lot of local knowledge of how this system works and how they can be improved. And, and they are being built actually by Japanese in Japan. The, there's not perhaps the most famous startup scene in Japan, but there's some really cool stuff being, being built here. At the recent Medica Asia Fair, you participated in the panel how the pandemic changed the use of blockchain, AI, and cloud in healthcare. So going from previous question to this one, how exactly did these technologies uh, change Japan? Uh, the way I would view the changes would be as uh, exemplified by a few projects that we've launched in in this year that the first one i would talk to is is a joint project we started with uh, kyoto university for uh, cervical cancer detection the the most common type of, of women's health related cancer in japan and and what we're doing there is is we're working to build an ai tool for early stage detection of, of uh, cervical cancer. And this is a project that we've done largely remotely. So, so we've, of course, uh, uh, had negotiations and, and data transfer, etc. But largely, we've been doing this remotely. Last year, I don't think we could embark on this type of joint research project with with medical data in a remote setting. So, so, so I think that that's that's the the first sort of big takeaway that that the industry and the market is is getting more ready for remote work. Uh, the, the second part I would say is, is about new market entrants and new ways of thinking. So at Medical Fair Asia, we, we've just introduced a collaboration together with Mitsubishi Electric, where we are combining our capabilities for medical AI imaging with their industrial robots. And what we're doing is we're building basically a, a full stop solution for automating lab work. So uh, transporting samples, analyzing and classifying sample, and then processing samples. And this type of idea of, of how can we make sure that research scientists, lab scientists can do their work remotely, right? So for, for people that work with a computer and a, and a desk, it's, it's of course not so difficult to, to work from home. But for this type of tasks, it's been a challenge to do it remotely, but this type of collaborations, like the one we're doing with Mitsubishi Electric, is showing how 2020 is kind of pushing the envelope on other realms where we can also move towards a, a remote environment. So, so that's another uh, kind of change, I would say, that, that I've seen uh, in this year. So a push towards uh, a willingness to do this type of complicated projects in a remote nature, but also thinking about new ways to bring technologies from other spaces into the healthcare space to allow more people to, to be more efficient. So nothing specific regarding uh, blockchain, if we just uh, try to add that. There are things that are coming out in the blockchain space. And, and as, as I think it's fair to say that it definitely had a peak and, and then a little bit of, of, of a bust, the, the blockchain trend, and that what's surviving and what's coming out now is really things that, that, that make sense. And one of the things that, that you, of course, can do with, with a, a blockchain structure or, or, or a shared ledger is around patient security in terms of securing their data, ensuring who has access to the data, and ensuring who uh, uh, is allowed to, to interact with it. Uh, that And for that, I haven't seen so much initiatives in, in Japan, but I, I did uh, hear from another panelist during the, the session at Medical Fair uh, Asia, uh, uh, another company that's working on some really cool stuff in, in this space. You mentioned briefly that you work with medical imaging. And uh, so H uh, Hackerus is also designing decision support systems for radiologists. I think this is a really interesting and important topic because Japan has a very high number of diagnostic imaging instruments such as CT and MRI devices. But uh, according to the data published, the paper published, I looked at one from 2000. 2015, and it said that a very large number of imaging examinations are performed, uh, but in the absence of uh, radiologists. And um, 
60 to 70 percent uh, um, are done in the absence of a radiologist. So it seems very interesting for me to think about what that means uh, in terms of the accuracy of reading the, the tests done with these machines. So I assume that your company can play an important role in aiding even non-radiologists? I, I think that's that's an excellent uh, question. And it really brings home some of the key value propositions of the work that we're, we're doing at Hackerus. So what we're really about is digitizing human expertise. So just as you say, there's a lot of equipment, but there's not enough specialists that are able to interpret scans. We see this in our work with, with uh, the cerebral cancer example I, I, I raised before, but we also have projects like working with, with, uh, Kobe University on early stage liver, uh, cancer detection using MRI imaging, uh, as, as well as projects with, with companies like, uh, Wara Pharmaceutical looking at, um, brain stroke classification in, in MRI images. And the problem tends to be the same. You have a, a expertise that's needed to be able to detect, classify, look at these images. And this expertise, it does exist, but it's very limited. It means that large hospitals in large cities will have it, but you won't find it everywhere and you won't find it at where it's needed all the time because people People get sick, people have injuries, people have uh, problems, no matter where, where they happen to be located. So really what, what, what our work is largely about is how do we take that specialist knowledge and how do we create AI models that are able to replicate that expertise and provide those insights to doctors or caregivers that are at, 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 at sites where you don't have that level of, of, uh, um, specialist knowledge. So, and, um, I think the equipment itself is always going to be needed. It's rather about how can we bring the additional insights that an expert could give when looking at these scans to, to the doctor in charge or the caregiver in charge at, at the institution. And so, so I really think you've, you've circled on a problem that, that we are really trying to tackle right now. Another interesting thing in this regard is that if we started by saying that there's a lack of radiologists uh, to read all the imaging scans, um, um, uh, in May this year, another article was published about the advent of medical artificial intelligence. And that was specifically based for, for Japan. And kind of the, one of the findings was that the demand for an AI literate workforce has outpaced training programs and knowledge in Japan. So it's not just about having specialty knowledge such as radiology. It's also that doctors need to have some familiarity with AI. So how do you bridge that gap? Yeah, no, I, I, again, I, I think that that's fair. It's not a uniquely Japanese uh, problem, uh, to, to be frank, that this is something that's being seen across, uh, healthcare systems in, in, in the world. But, but absolutely, Japan is, is a good example of it. Um, so I think there are, there are a few things that are going on. So on one hand, there's the, the hype machine that provides these very uh, extravagant articles about these magical things that you can do with, with with AI. And then there's the reality of what can be achieved and and what can be done. Um, And and that gap can sometimes be a a problem in terms of of managing expectations from from, uh, users, doctors, etc. But on the other hand, it's it's also a, a lack of knowledge of how these things actually work. So the way we've attacked it from the hackerist point of view is is we launched a training program for the medical industry, which we call the Hackerus AI Academy. And the Hackerus AI Academy is, is a full course program where we train uh, doctors, medical professionals, researchers in pharmaceutical companies, etc., the basics mm-hmm. of how to work with AI. And, and what's special about this program or what we're doing is, is we're actually taking them from the very beginning, but through the, the several month course, we actually do an, a real project with real medical data and they are the ones that are doing it. Our, our team assists, our team guides, etc. but they actually make a real project with their own data to get a first feel for how it works. 
and and that way of of educating and sharing this knowledge i think it's 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 the way to approach uh, this 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 uh, uh knowledge gap uh, from our perspective what where we are is is we're specialists in data science in in building these algorithms for uh, prediction classification detection etc we are not specialists in the medical field so 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 by training by sharing the knowledge we have we allow there to be a, a a point where we can meet and they can bring their expertise and we can bring our expertise and and hopefully together we can build something very meaningful is there a lot of interest for these training programs because i think when you say healthcare it the kind of the sentiment is oh my god just don't you know this is boring this is something that's going to make my life harder but when you say ai it's like oh this is futuristic this is something cool i'm interested in this who doesn't want to know anything about something about ai these days no i i i think you 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 make a good point in that it it is a trend concept and it's something that 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 people are very interested in and it's one of those uh, the year of ai next winter next you know it's always there's always a talk about ai being a, being a big uh, trend um so I, I, what i would say is is the program has been very well received but we've actually seen more interest i would say from industry than we've seen from uh uh doctors that are working in in uh, hospitals directly it's, it's been more interest from the pharmaceutical the medical device uh, as as well as sort of higher up management in in hospital structures that that have taken these classes uh, originally we thought it's going to be more of the actual uh, doctors that, that that would take it uh, but I, i i think that as i mentioned earlier there's a recognition of the need to digitize and there's a recognition of of the potential of what could be done and that really fuels a strong interest in in programs like our ai academy the hackers ai models are used in genome analysis regenerative medicine to aid in developing methods to regrow repair or replace damaged or diseased cells organs or tissues as you mentioned before you also offer your ai to aid pharma with drug discovery so can you perhaps outline a little bit your vision you know how do you see that the future could look like how would problems be solved and which problems specifically you see as most potential to be solved at at the core of of all of these uh, life science related use cases which which are sort of the next frontier um we we are an organization that doesn't just look at the problems at hand that we're helping customers and partners solve right now but also looking at where is the cursor going where are we going to be in 10 15 years and, and what's going to be needed a lot of the use cases you mentioned here are relatively new uh, technologies and new areas for ai deployment but that's where we see things going so so that's why we're we're, we're putting the emphasis here we have a a um co-located office in Kobe at the life science uh, hub there the largest life science hub in, in Japan where we have access to to a full wet lab and where we're working on on this type of of uh, solutions at the end of the day what i think it's really about is the ability to speed up and guarantee success of experiments so it's it's about shortening the experiment uh, cycle and massively increasing the amount of of outcomes that can be had by simulations uh, as well as predictions of results so rather than than doing a uh, uh, a large set of experiments we can simulate or or predict which uh, components are going to uh, react with with which processes and by that uh, approach reduce the amount of of experiments that are needed for a successful outcome so i i think it's a question of automation and it's a question of of increasing efficiency and this will span across all of these uh, use cases at the moment there are still a lot of ai related concerns in the use of ai first of all algorithms are very narrow most ai models are based on retrospective studies lacking real wor- world validation uh, which is needed before wider adoption in the clinical practice then there's two other issues that are challenging ai development 
and that's AI brittleness and concept drift, which in essence means that uh, the changing accuracy of AI models refers to when they're transferred to one data set to another. And an AI model trained on a data set from one hospital can fail when it's transferred to a different data set in a different hospital. Additionally, uh, what can occur even when a model works is the concept drift, which is a decrease in accuracy of AI models over time. So how are you addressing these issues? I think the first thing we, we need to collectively uh, uh, communicate and, and understand when it comes to these, these types of technologies, an, an AI model or an AI tool is, is not Microsoft Word or uh, uh, Facebook Messenger. What I'm trying to say is that it's, it's not a, a strict piece of software that you build, you test, you ship, and then, then it's finished and it's the same interface and the same way to interact with it no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing. It, it's rather to be seen as a tool for, for automation in specific fields and use cases. So one of the examples you raised is uh, if you transfer a, a model from, from one piece of equipment to another one, so a different type of, of data format or a different uh, type of, of conditions, then you're going to get uh, very different results. And that's because what you've trained the algorithm to do is, is detect in that specific format for those specific things. So it's not interchangeable. You, you, you can't just uh, switch things out. Um, so, so, so that's a challenge that, that, uh, I would say something that boils down to having a, a better understanding of the limitations of, of what can be done. So rather than, than, than seeing that as a problem, you can also see that as a, a, a strong opportunity for really customized uh, healthcare solutions so that uh, you can create a framework where the top level AI algorithm is the same, but the implementations, the, the, the actual developed uh, uh, implementations are unique to that hospital. Because there can be things that are unique to the people that, that visit this hospital, the geography, the ethnicity, the, the entire kind of conditions of, of, of the people that attend that hospital that can't be translated to another continent, another country, or maybe even another city. So, so I think we need to think about it as tools that, that are heavily optimized for this specific use case. And when you think about it like that, some of these things actually become uh, advantages. Uh, what you're talking about in terms of, of models decreasing in, in, in performance over time, again, I think that, that, that boils down to the same question or the same point. You, you can't say that it's, it's a finished product. It, it's probably never a finished product. It's continuously in need of updates. It's continuously in need to get better with more data or new data. So, so, so I, I'd say you, you, you don't deploy a solution and then say, Hey, my work here is done, but rather you commit to a continuous journey of improving the algorithm and improving it for, for that specific uh, use case of that specific uh, uh, model. Uh, the last thing I, I think we, we should talk about on, on this topic of sort of some of the challenges is uh, the black box problem. So that the fact that when you use deep learning based uh, approaches, the sheer amount of input variables is, is too difficult for, for humans to understand. So you end up with a result, but you can't really understand the method and the path that was taken to arrive there. And that's really holding back deployments in a lot of, of uh, use cases for medical, because we want to understand why is it that the model is making this recommendation, not only what is the, the recommendation. And, and that's another area where, where I think a hacker stands out and where, where we have a strong proposition in that, that we are using a, a proprietary AI engine that is based on a technology called sparse modeling that we've been developing over the past seven years or so. It's not uh, unique to hackers. There are, there are other uh, companies that they use sparse modeling as well. Uh, you'll perhaps know it from the first ever image of a black hole that was created using sparse modeling a few years back. But with sparse modeling, inherent in its design is a hard, high level of explainability. Uh, human understandable explainability. Basically, what we can do is we can create a, a dictionary of the features that 
represent an, an outcome. And when we're presented with new data, we look for these features uh, in, in, in the data set. This means that we can help doctors, practitioners, and, and healthcare uh, professionals to understand why our models have made certain recommendations. We can point to the specific reasons, and this is really opening a lot of doors for us in terms of coming into to medical use cases. Do you think it's possible to compare AI development in Japan to other countries? It's kind of an ungrateful question, but I don't know if there's a comment that you might have. So, so, so I, I think that this is a trend that's sweeping the globe where Japan is one of, of many countries at, at the forefront. Of course, you're going to have your, your American, Canadian, uh, UK, uh, Israel. Uh, you, you're going to have a, a large set of, of, of countries that are, are doing quite well here and have good universities and have good uh, uh, know-how and good companies coming out. Uh, if I could point to something that would be sort of uniquely Japanese or uniquely special uh, to Japan, it's probably that, that we tend to start by wanting to understand the specific desired outcome. So, so we have a sort of a value-driven perspective on development. So, so rather than, than building very advanced and technically elegant solutions, we start by understanding what is the expected customer outcome, and then we work our way back from that to build our solutions. So I, I think that ensures that, that you're going to have a very high level of, of customer satisfaction or, or high level of usage of the finished product. But it also means that you may not have the same amount of uh, uh, newsworthy stories in, in terms of, of the solutions coming out. I just have one question for you left, uh, an easy one. How has living in Japan impacted your health and healthy habits? Yeah, I, I think that Japanese uh, cuisine isn't only delicious, it's also quite healthy. So uh, I, I originally come from, from Sweden, which is a kind of a meat and potato kind of uh, country. Uh, and um, living in, in Japan and, and, and being part of, of, of life here is, is definitely allowing you to have a more healthy lifestyle in terms of the food, uh, but also in terms of, of some of the, the, the customs around tea drinking, as, as, you, as you mentioned before. And also, I'd say uh, there it's, it's, it's a country of people that like to go out, uh, take a walk, uh, see something beautiful and... Um, I, I think that's rubbed off a bit on me as well. I, I don't think it's because of Japan, but I, I've relatively recently also got two dogs, so they definitely keep me more healthy than, than I, I would have been without them. You've been listening to Faces of Digital Health. If you enjoyed the show, leave a rating or a review by going to www.lovethepodcast.com slash faces of digital health and you will be redirected to the platform appropriate for your device. Stay tuned.